of victory. I want to talk to you because this is tabernacle. And I want you to understand something, that the Feast of Tabernacles, the main purpose, or one of the main purposes of the Feast of Tabernacles, is to ensure that you have a better harvest in the future than you had last year. The main, the main premise of all these set times, these moments, these, these appointments with some God, is so that God can become one with man, and man can become one with God. But any time you have God connected with man, man has to walk in victory. And see, the thing is, we've been trying to gain victory without God. We've been trying to gain victory with money, gain victory with our resources, gain victory with our job. But God said, if you want real victory, you got to connect with me. You want a victory. You got, you, you, got, you got to forget about man and just concentrate on me. And I believe that we understand the principles that are hidden within these feasts that we can operate in total victory. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. One of the things we learned, we, we have already discovered. So I'm going to go over some things that we've already discovered. Let's see how God can bless our life. Is there anybody here who actually wants to walk in victory? Yeah. Is there anybody here who truly desires to live a victorious life. Does anybody truly desire to make sure that you'll feel your seed and your oncoming harvest is at its best level? Oh, bless the name of our Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And this is going to fit right in for you because when you understand these principles being passed, they'll, they'll understand that they are in place to teach us how to access victory. If you look at the, at the, at the Feast of Tabernacles, one of the, one, one of the signs one of the signs of victory, one of the proofs, one of the evidences of victory uh, we learned was the blood. Amen. You cannot, you cannot have victory with God, victory in God without the blood. There, there's nothing God would ever accept as being uh, uh, great from him or to him without the blood. Even in the earth realm, there had to be a sacrifice. In the old days, they used the lamb, they used the eagle, they used the dove, they used certain things. But there had to be the shedding of blood before God would accept the sacrifice. Even in the old days, when it wasn't good enough, there had to be a sign of blood. The blood was a sign that the curse was gone. When you're dealing with Feast of Tabernacles, we are dealing, dealing with uh, what we've learned so much with Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah. We learned all these things. And we learned that when, when, they, when God allowed, when God told the people to put the blood upon the altar and sprinkle it seven times, that was so that the curses could be gone. You got to understand something because when you when you look at what Jesus already done, you ought to feel victorious inside your spirit because you realize that what he's already done has got you walking in a constant state of victory. Amen, somebody. Amen. The blood is a sign the curse is gone and the blood is a sign that sin was remitted and life was restored. You got to understand that when you see the blood, when you see what Jesus has done, you understand that number one, that Jesus bled seven times. We are reminded the same way the high priest had to go before the ark and he had to sprinkle the blood seven times. Before that, or before that altar, he had to bleed seven times. Jesus bled seven times, and every time he bled, it broke a curse. Every time. He didn't bleed for, for to no avail. Every time he issued out his life force, it was to do something better for you. The Bible teaches us that he bled in the Garden of Gethsemane, which means that when he bled in the Garden of Gethsemane, he bought back your willpower. He bought back your mental anguish. He bought back the addiction that goes on in our life. Sometimes we don't realize that we already have the legal blood bought right to walk in the freedom. When your mind is oppressed, you're walking under a curse. But when you apply the blood of Jesus to those areas that have oppressed you, you have a right to walk in freedom. Amen. 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 Amen, somebody. You don't have to walk around here with your hand, your head in your hand, not knowing which way to turn. When God has already shed his blood so that you can have the right to have a free mind. I'll give you peace in your mind and you keep your mind stayed on me. The Bible teaches us here, not only did he bleed in the garden, but he also bled with the stripes on his back. We understand that when he bled with those stripes on his back, that every disease and every sickness known to man was taken upon himself. So that now that when I'm afflicted with certain things, I have a little right to tell the enemy, you can't have me. When I'm afflicted, when, when I'm afflicted, now 
no say I'm not going to be afflicted because life is full of ups and downs. Right, right. Something can happen at any moment. But when I am afflicted, I have a legal right to tell the afflictor that you can't have me because Jesus has already bought my, my healing on the cross. Yes. Every time they whooped him, I was getting free. Every time they beat him, I was getting healed. Every time they opened him up, I was coming out of some kind of sickness. Yes. Teaches us, it teaches us that not only that did he beat, did he bleed in the garden, not only did he bleed off his back, but he bled with the crown of thorns being pressed in his head. Now, when he bled with the crown of thorns pressed in his head, it broke the poverty, the poverty spirit. A lot of us don't realize that the blood is a sign that you have a right to walk in, in a, 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 not poverty, but walk in the prosperity of God. People don't realize that when he bled, he was not only breaking the back of the enemy, but he was breaking the back over your life. Because in Genesis, he told Adam, by, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to have to toil in this world, in this earth. And the, and, and the earth which was plenteous to you is now going to be hard and resist you with thorns and thistles. But when the thorn that was the curse hit the blood that was in our sacrifice, it had to give up the ease which was used to be hard. That means that you have a legal right to expect the prosperity that's laid up for you to come into your hands. Yes. You don't have to be poor all your life. Amen. And prosperity comes in more ways than money, but money is included in that process. Amen. You can be prosperous in all of other things, but you got to include the money also in that because God didn't design for his people to be a squatter. Well, well, well. God didn't design for you to be a beggar. God didn't design for you to be going around not knowing how you're going to um, pay your bills. God has already put your provisions upon himself when he bled. The Bible teaches us not only, not only did he bleed from his head with the crown of thorns, but he, bru he, he bled from his bruises. His bruises was something from in his skin. He, 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 bled, he bled from on the inside. When he bled from his bruises, he broke the curse of iniquity. I'll teach y'all something real quick here. We're gonna move right on. We're gonna move right on. But when 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 Jesus let them beat him, see a bruise is something um, that you can see the evidence of on the outside, but the damage is done on the inside. Right, right, right. Anybody ever been hurt so bad that the folks around you couldn't see it, but you were still hurting anyway on the inside? Jesus allowed himself to be afflicted to the point of where they was bruised, but he was bruised for our iniquity. Now he was bruised because he knew that sin would be a problem and so would transgression. But if he didn't take care of iniquity, we would always have a driving force to go right back into that faraway land. Iniquity is not just the reward for repetitive actions of sin, and it is that. It is a reward for repetitive sin, the thing you keep doing over and over again. It is that. But it is also the nature. It is also the driving force that gets behind you and makes you do things that you don't know why you're doing it. Why do you keep on lying? I don't know. Why do you keep on cheating? I don't know. Why do you keep on crossing the line? I don't know. It's the iniquity that's deep-rooted inside of us that shows up in generations. Why did, why did my mama have cancer? Why did I have cancer? Why did my daddy have cancer? If you see the same sin or the same sickness or the same plague in a line generation after generation, that is iniquity. And that's what he broke when he bled in his bruises. You have a right to walk in victory based on what he's already done for you. Amen? Amen. Somebody shout victory. Victory. You learned that he bled also in his hands. When he bled in his hands when they nailed the five inch spikes through his carbon radio bowl. The Bible tell, teaches us that he got back what man lost, which was man's authority. Right. See, I have victory in the blood because without the blood I have no authority. But when I apply and appropriate the blood of Jesus Christ, I get back what Adam lost. Adam had authority, but he lost authority. But when I step in last Adam's blood, I get back what he lost, and I have authority. Yeah. See, when I walk in authority, it's just not in the church, but it's in my home. It's just not in the church, but it's on my job. It's wherever I go, whatever I put my hand to, I have the authority of heaven at my disposal. And because he's already bled, I have the sign of victory that whenever I put my hand to do something, I got victory. If I'm doing taxes, kids, I got victory. If I'm cleaning houses, I got victory. If I'm doing a body, I got whatever I'm doing with these hands, I got victory. 
I said victory. Blood is a sign of victory because he shed his blood in his hand. I got victory. But it also teaches us that when he shed his blood in his feet, I got back something that we as a body so badly need, which is dominion. He said in Genesis, let us make man after our image and after our likeness. And let us give them dominion over the fish, over the fire, over every creeping thing. Man had dominion, but because of sin, man lost dominion. But when Jesus Christ came and bled in his feet, every footstep we take, he said, I'll give it to you everywhere you go. Where your feet trod, I'll give it back to you. Whatever, whatever ground you lost because of the enemy, you can now take other steps to gain back that dominion all right. We've been, we've been pushed around too long. We've been, we've been pushed out of our spot. We've been pushed out of our home, pushed out of our ministry, pushed out of different places. But if you start taking the step of victory according to the blood of Jesus, you can take back dominion over things that you have forfeited. Because the devil can't win unless you stop fighting. The devil can't beat you. All you can do is forfeit your God-given position. But when I know what God has given me, I can now take steps of authority and dominion. And once I stand in the dominion of heaven, there's no devil that can push me out of my spot. I don't care how big your dream is, if you are in the dominion of heaven, you can have whatever you say. I don't care how big your vision is, once you walk under the dominion of heaven, you can have exactly, he'll give you the desires of your heart once you stand in dominion. also bled from his sides. When he bled from his side, the Bible says that that teaches us that he was he was he was um, curing the curse of brokenness. He was curing the curse of brokenness and demonic soul ties. Because one of the things that this church and all around the world is going to have to get free from, we want to get free from the demonic connection that we shouldn't be connected to. Because we come to church just to get free from some mess that we should be bothered in the first place. We use the church as a safe haven for a little while and go right back to hell. Oh, come on, somebody. But because he was bleeding from his side, the Bible teaches us that spear, it touched the heart of God. You can't get no more broken than a broken heart. So when he bled from his heart, every time you cried over Bob, you cried over Sue, every time you cried over them, breaking your heart, Jesus said, I took care of that on the cross. You don't have to walk around because somebody walked out. Jesus walked to the cross because he suffered, because he bled, because out of his side, you have a right to overcome every area of brokenness in your life. Not just your feelings. But your home. Maybe your mind is broken. Maybe your, your, your spirit is broken. Maybe your soul is broken. Maybe your relationship with your children is broken. Maybe your job ability is broken. But whatever is broken in your life, because he bled from his heart, you have a legal right to claim wholeness in the areas of brokenness. Isn't that good news? And he's going to free us from the money soul time. His blood does something that we won't do for ourselves. See, because of his blood, he starts a process. The God has been trying to tell us for so long to leave certain things, certain places, and certain people alone. He's been trying to get us free from certain people, places, and things because he knows that they're not conducive to our outcome. He knows that certain people will suck you dry till you have nothing left. Oh, it'll feel good to you, but not be good for you. He's trying to free you up from the wrong people for your purpose and for your destiny. There are certain things you shouldn't have in your life. Because we hard him, because we, we stiff neck. He had to go ahead and die. He had to shed his blood so that when you come to yourself, you have a right to be able to appropriate the blood. And this time when I get free, I ain't never going back. Any of y'all ever said, Lord, if, I, if, you, if you get me out of this mess this time, any of y'all said, Lord, if you, if, you just, if you just heal me this time, if you let me wipe the tears for the last time on this thing here, I swear I'll never go back here. Well, he gave you the blood so that when your mind gets made up, you can shut the door on all that mess. He teaches us. He teaches us. He teaches us. In Matthew 26, he says, when he was doing the Lord's Supper with his disciples, he says, for this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for the many for the remission of your sin. I'm learning, 
Pastor, that we need to operate in victory. If we as a people are going to be mature, then we got to start shouting for things other than cars, houses, husbands, and wives. We got to start shouting for things other than materialistic stuff. You ought to be shouting that your sins have been washed away. You ought to be coming to staff knowing that your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. If you don't have a car, are you going to heaven? If my sins have been washed away, that's enough reason to give God the praise. If your sins have been washed away, that's another reason to come to step for God. Amen. He says here in the word in Leviticus 17, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. I'm going to read that again so we'll get this. He said, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. God said, and I have given it to you upon the altar. So you got to understand now, my victory becomes because the blood worked to remit, to remove my sins. But the blood also worked because it was a gift from God. The blood works because God gave the blood as an active agent to put in a place where he was going to come. The Bible says that he gave the blood for me upon the altar to make an atonement for my soul. For it is the blood that maketh the atonement. Now, go on to the next one. Another sign of victory besides the blood is the altar. When you understand the Feast of Tabernacles, it's all about ceremonies. You'll notice that they have a priest that will be allowed. We learned in Yom Kippur, we learned in Rosh Hashanah, we learned even in Tabernacles, that the priest has a very distinct job that he has to do a, a specific thing and he has to go through certain rituals and rites in order to uh, um, get into the presence of God and allow God to come down into this place. Amen? Amen? So we learn now, we learn now that through that, that there's a time that he has to go before that altar. So the altar, now when I see, if I understand what the altar is for, I will be able to handle the altar different. I believe sometimes we handle the altar wrong. Now, I, 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 there, there are several, several, we don't have time to teach tonight, but there are several different reasons and several different altars. But the altar for sin, the altar for God's presence, this is a unique altar. Because when you're dealing with the altar that deals with God's presence here, you can't come before God just any kind of way. Come on, saints. So when I'm dealing, when I'm dealing with the altar, when I'm dealing with the altar, the Bible teaches me, the Bible teaches me, it is a sign of of sacrifice. If I want to know how I can get victory out of the altar, and the altar is a sign of sacrifice, then, every, then I'm learning that every time I sacrifice, I'm getting victory. Okay, let's, let's go with this here. We know that Jesus was our sacrifice. We know that Jesus, he had to die. He had to suffer, bleed, and die. He became our propitiation. He became our mediator. He became our lamb and our goat for our sins. Amen? Amen. But the same way Jesus had to sacrifice for us, he turns right around and tells humanity, now you have to sacrifice. Come on, come on. And every time you are denying yourself, every time you are putting yourself on the back burner, every time you are putting God before you and others before you, you are putting yourself in a place so you can win. Watch this, watch this. John 12 says, Verily I say unto you, Verily I say unto you, Except the corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now this is the part where we get to call the altar is a place of sacrifice and it is a place of death. And if you're going to make the best use of the altar to get to the presence of God, then you've got to understand that if I'm going to appropriate this altar, I must be willing to sacrifice and I must be willing to die. Because I don't need to come to the altar if I'm not ready to give up everything I got. Ain't no sense of me using the altar as a revolving door and going back home with the same intentions I had before I got here. When I come to God and say, Lord, I want to be the only altar, I must be willing before I get here to lay down. Lord, I surrender all. Everything I've got, God, i got to be willing to give it up because if I do not, I am not fit for the altar. The altar only works when the sacrifice is fit. 
it for God. Oh, you gotta watch this. Because God is not coming to the altar until the altar is ready for him. What he tells you, what he tells you, he tells you in Romans, I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. He said, you present you. The same way Jesus had to present himself to man and to God, you now have to take authority over your own self. Because when you get on the altar, you, you already know when I get there, everything on the altar will not be pleasant. Um, if you want to walk in victory, if you want to tabernacle with God, you must be willing to take what comes along with walking with God. Walking with God will always be easy. Walking with God will not always be pleasant. But if you want to be a mature saint, you must be willing to take the good days and the bad days. If you're going to successfully be in the presence of God and you're going to be able to be on the altar of God, then you must be willing to say, Lord, I understand before I give up everything that once I put myself on this altar, I'm giving up the rights to determine what happens to me as a sacrifice. Ooh, that's, that's, that's horrifying, that's scary, that's scary. Because, because once I get myself on the altar, I realize that the thing on the altar has to die. Now, now, if you just killed me quickly, that's one thing. But if you are cutting me and killing me in pieces, then, then sometimes I want to get up off this altar. And, and Paul said, you present yourself as a living sacrifice, which means that I must have a commitment to the working of the altar before the altar will work for me. Because when I get on that altar and, and things get a little unpleasant, and, and because it's my will, I can get up when I want to. But God gets no glory, you get no victory if you get yourself off the altar. You gotta stay there, and you gotta stay right there even when it don't feel good. You gotta stay down on the altar even when it don't, it, it don't, it don't look good in your life. You gotta stay right there until everything in you not fit for God is out of your life. That means that while God is pruning you and God is purging you and God is doing all these things in and out of your life, you gotta say yes, Lord, to your will. Yes. that the suffering of this present time are not even worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. You can't get the glory without some suffering. You can't walk with him if you're not willing to suffer the way he suffered. You can't be consistent with God if you can't be consistent in what goes on on the altar. And sometimes the altar makes you feel like running away. Sometimes the altar makes you feel like running away. But the thing about, like, about God is he gives you a choice. God gives you a choice, Brother Rod. He, he, he said, if you present your body a living sacrifice, which means, Bishop, that my mind has already been made up. I've already been fixed in myself that when I get down here, I'm going to do everything I can do to be acceptable unto the Lord. Because life has a way of getting hot and making me uncomfortable to where sometimes I feel like getting up and putting matters in my own hands. Talk to me, somebody. Life has a way of hurting you so bad that I just can't take this here no more. See, the, see if, the, if, the, if the sacrifice was alive and he was untethered, the sacrifice would give up on his own. But you got to be willing to stay right down there until God has finished his process. The only problem with that is our flesh is jumping in jittery. And there are times, there are times, even with the best prayer life, I'm going to get up anyway. There are times, there are times, even with the tongues in my life, I'm going to get up anyway. But God gave us some help. Yes, he did. He gave us some help. See, the same way uh, he'll treat us is how he treated the children of old. When they um, would come before his presence, they had something called the Ark of the Covenant. And they would lay, they would come before his presence and there was a lid uh, on top of it called the mercy seat. And what they would do is they would put the sacrifice on top of that thing. And, and it had to be still, it had to be still so God's glory could come down on top of the mercy seat. Now when God's glory came down, God 
glory came down with so much weight. The, the word is called Kabbalah. There was so much weight that when it hit that mercy seat, there was no power in earth to raise it back up. All right, all right. So whatever's on the mercy seat is held down by the glory. So sometimes you have to treat yourself like a mercy seat and ask God to just come sit on me. Yes, God. When you really want victory in your life, when you really Sit on me. That's the signs of victory. When I see the altar, Pastor, and I realize that the altar now is a sign of sacrifice, it's a sign of commitment, it's a sign of death, it's a sign of victory. Paul said, For me to die is to gain. The world teaches that fight for life. But there's something you're holding on to that you gotta die from. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, the reason you have no strength, the reason you're weak in some areas of your life, you're trying to hold on to stuff that God is trying to get you to die from. And you are fighting, you're tired. You wake up and you're tired. You're working and you're tired. But if you go ahead and just die to some stuff and let that joker die, God can give you life forevermore. It's a place of death. For you to die is to gain. And you got to realize that God has something on the other side of death. Because we haven't died to everything. See, none of us have gone to heaven yet. So by faith we believe that heaven is real according to the word of God. We've not walked the streets of gold yet. But by faith we believe the streets are of gold. Amen. We've not been able to conquer what's on the other side of them. And that's why we fight the death process in every stage of our life. Lord, what if it don't happen? What if this don't happen here? If you would just go ahead and trust God by faith and die to every situation in your life, he will show you on the other side of death is a resurrection. God don't bury stuff. God raises stuff up from the grave. Altar is a place of commitment. It's a place of sacrifice. It's a place of death. It is also a place that receives God. So another sign for that shows me I've got victory is fire. According to the principles of sacrificial doings in the old days, the way you knew that God had accepted the sacrifice is that fire would come down from heaven and it would consume the altar sacrifice. The way you knew that what you had presented before God was pleasing to God was that God would let fire from his throne, from his altar, come down and consume everything that you put before him. So fire is a sign of an accepted sacrifice. If you're looking for the signs of victory, then fire now becomes a sign of an accepted sacrifice. We learn in Romans 12 that we are supposed to be presenting our bodies and living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God. So what we got to do is make sure that what we present to God is accepted by God. Because when we do what's acceptable to God, then God will give us the privilege of receiving the fire from God. 
Okay, let's watch it. First Kings 18 tells us that Elijah and King Ahab was having a discussion about who was God. Who was God? Was it Baal or was it our God? Was it the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? So what, what, what Elijah said in verse 24, he said, let the God that answers by fire, let him be God. What had happened? What had happened was that he allowed the Baal prophets, all 400 of them, he allowed all of them to get together and, and, and cut themselves and cry out and do all types of mannerisms they could to invoke the spirit of Baal. When it didn't work, uh, he began to make fun of them, but then he said, let me go to work. That's right. He said, I want to show you what it takes to get God to move. Yeah. He said, I'm not going to come with a bunch of stuff. I'm not coming with a bunch of foolishness. I'm going to come with a sincere heart, and I'm just going to talk to him, me and myself. I'm going to strip myself of all this yeah. other stuff here, and it's just going to be me and my God. Yeah. He said, God, be so that they would know that you have sent me, you have called me now. Respond from on high. The Bible teaches us, the Bible teaches us, verse 38, then fire the Lord failed and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Now listen to me. You haven't walked in victory until the fire of God completely burns up everything that was there that wasn't of God in the first place. Which means that you don't have the right to get yourself off the altar no time soon. Because once you get on the altar, you, you don't get to be like him until you get in his presence and glory. So that means once I get on the altar, it's a lifetime endeavor. Once I lay myself, once I surrender, once I submit to get on the altar, I don't get off the altar until I'm walking those streets with him. Baba teaches me, teaches me now that when I get on there, that what he would do, he would send the fire down. And the fire, Pastor, would come down and it would consume everything on the altar that wasn't at a God level. That means that when you call God into your presence, when you call God into your presence, God will respond to you by doing you a favor and burning up everything attached to you that's not, not at a God level. That means that be careful sometimes when you call God into your presence because there's some relationship that's going to get burned up. Be careful. Be careful when you call God into your presence because there's some people, some places, and some things that will get burned up because God has to deal with everything not at his level. The sacrifice to make sure that it's pure so he can receive it to himself. Yeah. I'll, be, I'll be careful, I'll be careful wasting prayers, being fooled. The altar is no place to play around because when you come here, something is about to die. Yeah. Something about to die. Yeah. But it's also a sign of victory that when I receive the fire of God, when I receive the fire of God, it is a sign that I am walking in victory. Now, watch this. Just because I'm not burnt up yet doesn't mean I'm not being affected by the fire. It took time for the fire to fully consume the sacrifice. But once the fire started, it wouldn't stop until it was done with it. <laughs> so that means that I have to be able to realize that once the fire of God begins working in my life, I don't have to wait until it's all the way done. I can go ahead and start giving God praise now. Because once God gets in my life, he's not going to stop working on me until he's consuming everything that's not like him. All your old habits, he's going to consume all of them. All your old thoughts and ways, he will consume all of them. But you can't wait until perfection. You need to give him praise while you're still in the process. While you're still being processed, you, you go ahead and give God praise. Because when I'm in the fire, I'm walking in victory. Do you realize, do you realize that once God starts burning up stuff in your life, man, you have to understand that it's not going to be a pleasant experience. You be, be jumping shout thinking that's going to be a hunky door. No, no, sometimes fire hurts. It cleans, it purifies, it does all that, but sometimes fire hurts. But, but the outcome of fire is far better than the feelings of fire. Amen? You gotta understand some things. You gotta understand some stuff here that God is trying to work some stuff out of your life. So when I'm in the fire, 
not waiting on the finished offense. I'm praising God because he thought me worthy enough to start the fire process. That's good to right there. I almost could go on right there. Because in places in life, you've been told you're not good enough for this group. Not good enough for that group. Not good enough for this organization. Not good enough for this gender or this color. But God said, I looked at you and looked beyond your faults. And I saw enough quality of myself inside you to where I can start the process. And if God has started the process of cleaning you up, you ought not wait. themselves to the altar 
And what they would do is that they would pour the water out. And they would pour the wine out upon the altar. Now, what you got to realize is that Feast of Tabernacles is a harvest feast. This is a harvest feast. So the water represented the oncoming rain for the next harvest. This, this, this is going to get good. Okay. So the water of uh, the rain became a sign of a bountiful harvest. Now, you, 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 would say, you would say to yourself, now, what if I didn't have a good crop this year? And you would be thinking, you know, how can I shout? Ah, when so many people around me have so much more than I do. But when they would hear the sound of the pouring water, it would mean that God had given them a promise that their tomorrow would be better than their today. <laughs> what they would do is they would get in place so they could hear this water being poured. And even though they had empty hands, they had a whole bunch of faith. And if I can just hear the water being poured out, God is promising that my next harvest is going to be full. I might have a diminished harvest this time. I may have messed up in this season, but because And what Ahab had to do 
was to respond to what the man of God could hear. Because sometimes you can be in a place so long that all you can do is be affected by your situation. Sometimes you can be broken so long. Sometimes you can be down so long that getting up ain't even on your mind. Sometimes you can be hurt so bad that you don't even think it's possible to walk in health and prosperity and peace of mind. But you have to respond to what the mouthpiece of heaven said. He said, I hear a sound. God sent somebody to you to tell you, I heard from God. You better tap into what they said. Until you can hear it for yourself, you have to believe the word of God through his vessel. My God, my God. God would have brought you through all of this to bring you to this season and this time and not give you a word of encouragement. Even if you can't hear it for yourself, let me do this one tell you that I hear a sound. I hear a sound over your life. I hear a sound in your home. I hear a sound for your family for the abundance of rain. Bible tells us, Pastor, the Bible tells us after that, that they, they ran until it poured up. The Bible says that Elijah got so full of God. He got so, so full of God from being obedient to God, for being the conduit to be able to bring the word into the region that he got enough strength to outrun chariots. I want to show you something. When you lock on to what God said, it was just starting to rain. It was it hadn't it hadn't drenched it up yet. It was just drizzling. And because it was drizzling, it supercharges Elijah's faith. And Elijah gets enough spirit, enough zeal to be able to outrun the chariots. God has to tell you that when you align yourself with what heaven says, there's enough power infused in you to where with heaven's assistance you can act on natural assistance by yourself. Amen. It would have taken you 10 years to do it by now, but with God's help, you can do it in a week. Uh, Amen. You, may, you may have to grow five years, five weeks, but with God's assistance, you can, all, you can do it faster with God's assistance. Yes. Let's watch this. A couple things, a couple things. Couple of things, thank you, Jesus. It says here that the, the water, the rain, would be a sign. And then the poured water, so we're talking about the rain part, but the poured water would be a sign also for the seat was ready to receive the outpouring of God's glory. I'll show you something. The water represents the cooling, refreshing, flowing part of God's Holy Spirit. It's the continual part of God that stays with the person. It's not just a part that consumes. It's not just a part that refines. But there's a part of God's spirit that flows. There's a part of God's spirit that once you get into that place, it takes you from realms. It takes you in different levels. Because you're not going to different levels when you're on the altar. The fire is going to different levels. But when you're in the flowing part of the spirit, he allows you to go to different levels. When, when you get into God and you, you're now here and seeing the poured water, the poured water means that the seat now is ready to receive the glory of God. Watch this, watch this, watch this. So, so when, when I hear when I, when I hear the rain, I'm ready now to receive now um, the, the bountiful harvest. When I hear the poured water, then I'm ready now to receive um, um, the outpouring of God's glory. Now watch this. It says here in John 7, John 7, Jesus stood on the last day of this feast. Jesus said in John 7, 37, 38, he said, in the last day, on the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Jesus said, and he that believeth on me, as the scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay, let, let me hit this real quick. So Jesus, you said, a part of of the Hebraic Judaic, Judaic custom was for them to go to the pool every year. Now every year, because man couldn't complete the process, 
Man had to do all they could do just to satisfy or pacify God so I could live another year. So I would go to the pool every year and I would dip my silver pitcher into this water and I would take it and I would pour it out knowing that the next year I had to go right back to the same pool again to dip again. Jesus said, now that I'm on the scene, he said, now I'm going to be that pitcher. He said, now, if you, if any man are thirsty, he said, let him come to me and I'll give you something to drink. Yeah. When you are set in the set times, the poured water means that God will take his spirit and put in you so strong to where it not only fills you, but it also allows you to help fill others. Let me prove this. Let me prove it. Let me prove it. The Bible says in 38, and he that believeth on me, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers. All right. Anybody know anything about water knows that rivers flow out of and into something. Amen. If it's still water, it ain't no God. But if it's a movie, if it's a river, if it's a river, it's flowing into something. It, there, there's a big something going into the river, and that little river is flowing into something else. God has positioned you to go through all of the pain, go through all of the problems, go through all of the situation you've gone through, just so he can get glory out of you being on this altar. Lord, why? Why did I have to suffer? Lord, why am I going through? Why do you tears roll down my eyes? Just so I can get you to this point. Because if I can get you to this point, I can now put a river inside you. And you asking me to fill you up. But how is it if I can make you like Abraham? He told Abraham, I not only will I bless you, but I'll make you a blessing. See, God has a way of taking you and making you what you need to be for somebody else. Watch this, watch this. So he'll take you with your wet self and put you in a dry place. And you go to God asking God to fix your surroundings and God says, I did, I put you in it. You want God to move for the area and God is being quiet because God put the resources of heaven inside you. He said, if it's dry, you flow out. He said, I put a river of flowing water in your belly. If you are tapping what I put into you, you can change your family. You can change your job. You can change your block, change your city, change your state, change the world. We want the realm to do it. We want the deacon to do it. No, no, you do it. God put something inside of you. And that's why you cannot let folk disqualify you based on a title, based on a position, because everybody that has been connected to God has got a river flowing inside. I don't care what nobody says. You, your river is your river. It might not flow in my direction, but your river is still flowing from God. And you need to give God praise because God got some help. says here, another sign of victory, another sign of victory is that we get to hear, we get to experience order steps. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Bible teaches us that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Isn't that what it says? The Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Now that almost seemed like uh, it don't make sense because Turn right around and tell us there is none good but the Father. Mm -hmm. So you tell me there is none good but the Father. Uh -huh. And then tell me that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Mm -hmm. So if there's none in the natural realm good, then how can I how can I fit the qualification to have my steps ordered? Because the Bible says there's none good but the Father. But the whole purpose of being in the Feast of Tabernacles is so that me and God become one. Yeah. <laughs> By myself, I don't fit the qualification. But once I become in oneness with God, once me and God begin to dwell together, once God gets on the inside of me, I'm just not merely a natural man anymore. Amen. That's why you got to be careful how you handle people in your life. You got to be careful how you handle those who you can't see the God on. The Bible says, you, you know, you, don't, don't touch his anointing or do his power no more. It's not just talking about the man with the collar. Right. Yeah, you anointed too, amen? Right. You, you, got a, you got a word in a voice too, amen? Right. You got to be careful how you handle who God has called. Right. You got to be careful who, how you handle who God has placed in certain areas. Because right. once God has given in the inside of you, you and God become one. And now you're just not a mere mortal anymore. 
anymore. My steps are not mortal steps. Because if God is in me, it's God walking, not me. If God is in me, it's God talking, not me. So if it's me, God don't get the glory. But if it's God, God gets the glory. So use me and move me wherever you go. The Bible teaches us that if I see ordered steps in my life, it is a sign of victory. Because ordered steps is a sign of divine alignment. If I'm looking for victory in my life, I gotta look for it in small increments. And one of the ways that God will show you that He's giving you victory is to take the time to realign your life. Because most of us have to tell the truth that there are things in our life that still out of line with God. Come on, testify the truth now. That as much as we shout for God, there's some places in our life that still a little bit out of whack. There's some, there's some things in our life we still are not doing just the way we ought to do. There's some things we think, some places we go, some ways we act still need some tweaking and some work on it. Amen? But God does a privilege. God, God has a process in this time. And he will, he will give you the privilege of having your life aligned with heaven. There's a process, there's a process, there's a process called being synchronized. What he'll do, what he what he would do, what he would do is that the book tells us that what he had those three processes, processionals of priests, east gate, the west gate, and the south, they had them in different places. And what they would do, they would line themselves up. And they would be in places. Oh, this can get good to me. And they was over here. And, there, and behind this head priest, there was a whole row of priests. And behind this priest over here, there was a whole row of priests. And behind this priest over here, there was a whole row of priests. And at the sound of one sound, there'd be a blast up from the shofar. Without anybody telling them anything, the Bible teaches us that they would start walking at the same time on the same foot. The Bible said that all the priests were so in tune to that sound that when they heard that sound, everybody in front and behind would start walking at the same time. Now, this is the first time and the only time in recorded history that this has been proven that they will start out <laughs> uh, because you might have some new priests in the back and they weren't quite up to the, the, the process. So what they would do is they would start walking and while those was in the back was out of line, they just keep stepping. Now where they're walking to, they're walking to the temple, to the presence of God. Now they have to get in alignment and get in order steps before they get to the place of God. But just because they're a little bit out of step, don't they stop walking? Now I'm going to help you out real quick here because a lot of us get beat down in life because we're not walking in all the way in order steps. But the fact remains that even though some of them were out of step, they kept on walking. You got to keep walking even when you're out of step. Somebody on the outside yeah. gonna see you on the inside. 
inside. And they're going to testify to the change that's in your life. So order steps. Order steps now is a sign that God is aligning my life. When, when, I, when I am in the process of God ordering my steps, I have to be willing to fail and keep walking. When I am looking for victory in order steps, I have to realize I don't know how to have synchronized steps, so he got to train me. So until he's trained me, I'm going to be out of step in some areas of my life. And i got to learn to stop throwing in the towel, stop throwing my hands up, and stay right where God has called me to be until my life is in line with God. We had more of a true Christian. We wouldn't see all this revolving door in and out of the church. But to learn how to stay right where God puts you until he can develop you into what he's called to do. Anytime I hear you, I quit. You ain't walking with God. Because if you was walking in the life with God, you'd have no sense to know if I keep on walking and still mess up, he's going to get me right after a while. How can people talk to you and make you defeat yourself? How can people beat you down until you feel like quitting? Just because your steps might not be as grand as somebody else's step. See, I might not have the fluid steps of, of, of Pastor Woodbury. I might not have the seasoned steps of, of Bishop Brigham, but it doesn't matter. I'm still stepping. Amen. The fact remains that God gave me strength in this body. If I'm sick, I'm going to keep stepping. If I'm broke, I'm going to keep stepping. If I fail the test, I'm going to keep stepping. He wants to dwell with us. 
He wants to live with us. He wants to live in us. He wants to abide in us, right? He, he wants us to be in him and him be in us, right? All right, all right. So what they would say is, they would teach us, uh, while they are walking in these synchronized steps, while they are in these areas that they couldn't see each other, and they couldn't see each other, and, 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 and let me say this too, when they started walking, they knew they had a goal. The goal was to get to the temple. They couldn't see the temple when they started. All they could do was follow the one who knew the way. Even if they were out of step, they had to trust the fact that whoever is leading me knows the way to where I'm going. Now watch this. Watch this. So it teaches me that while they were in these processions, they would reach down, Pastor, and they would reach down, and they would find these broken things. They would find these broken pieces. They would find these broken willows, these broken palm branches. They would find these broken myrtle branches, and, and they put them in the right hand. These were the fine branches. These were the estate branches. These were the pretty branches. These were the branches of honor in their right hand. But the book says they would also take this one called the etron, which is the citron tree. They would put that in the left hand. Now they would take that um, citron, that etron, and they would turn it upside down. And they said while they were walking in synchronized step, they would wave these branches in the air. Now what would happen was they would there would be so many people waving these branches in a synchronized manner at the same time. The people who couldn't see them, they could hear them approaching based on the sound. Yeah. <laughs> they could tell that um, they was about to enter into the place of God based on what they could hear. They were walking in a place that's unfamiliar to them, being led by a person they hope was going in the right direction. And while they was doing it, God was trying to align their steps and get them in line with, with heaven. But while they was going through the, the, the failing and the passing the test, they would take these branches and they would wave these branches in the air. Now what would happen is, as they got closer to the temple, they said the sound of the wind got greater. Now, now let me help you real quick. We got a little shout right there. Now, while they are waving these good branches on the right hand, you forgot that there were some bad branches in the left hand. The etrog represents man. And man has no ability in our approach to God to fix ourselves. So man is turned upside down. But the good news about that, Pastor, even though I'm turned upside down, he still allowed me in the process to him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Even though I'm not as pretty as the other branches, he still brings me into the same processional as everybody else. My life is upside down, but he can get on in. My home is upside down, but I can get in the process. Everything about me is upside down, but he's still calling me. Session 
was all going to the same place. And when they got to the same place, they were going to receive the same God. All right. And even though there were some things that was wrong on one side, he gave this side the same rights and privileges as this side, right? Yes. So when the psalmist said, let everything that have breath praise you the Lord, he knows that when I get my people in the same place and get them to give me the same praise, I'm going to show up. Yes. You're going to show up? But the problem is, you want a consistent God, but you won't give him a consistent way. You want a consistent God, but you're not consistent in your praise. Lord, I'm hurting, but you gotta praise him. Lord, I'm going through, but you gotta praise him. I got tears in my eyes, God, but but you gotta praise him. I don't know how it's gonna work out, God. That's fine, but you gotta praise him. Because the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. If you just praise him, even when they're going through, God will show up. And once God shows up, whatever's wrong got to be right. Woo, God, oh God. But I wonder if there's some people in here tonight that have some up, down, upside down stuff in your life. Some children upside down, some money upside down, some stuff in your soul that's still upside down. I wonder if you take the legal license you have been given to give God a praise so he can turn some stuff around. I wonder, I wonder if there's anybody in here who says, Lord, I'm not waiting on the outcome, but I'm going to praise you right now. In my brokenness, I'm going to praise you. In my poverty, Lord, I'm going to praise you. In my suffering, Lord, I'm going to praise you. While I'm needing you, I'm going to praise you. You want? 